We've got 45 minutes, I think it's until 12.40, and then we've got some announcements. So let me pray, and uh, then we'll begin. Lord, I want to thank you so much for the privilege of being here. I want to thank you that you've given us all of Christ. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for your presence this morning. We thank you that you've come to indwell the likes of us so that you might express your life through us. And we lean on you to be the teacher now. And I thank you in advance for your name's sake. Amen. So this morning, turn to Joshua chapter 1. And we're going to take a look at the commissioning of Joshua. And I need to confess that I need somebody's Bible. Thank you so much. Joshua chapter 1. When I was in Bible school 100 years ago, uh, one of the teachers lectured on the book of Acts. And one of the things that he said uh, shocked me at the time. And the more I thought about it in the meantime, the more it makes sense. He said to us this. He said, don't pray to be used by God. Uh, that shocked me because I thought that was the goal of the exercise. He said, don't pray to be used by God, but pray to be made usable. Pray to be made usable by God. And what we're talking about this morning is the person God uses. And some of the things that are prerequisites and belong to uh, God preparing us to be used. And if you read scripture carefully, you'll come to realize that some of the people that God used in the scriptures were highly unlikely candidates. And if you take an even closer look, God had an easier time sometimes with animals than he did with people. And that ought to humble us. So let's look at the person God uses in Joshua chapter 1. And I'll read verses 1 to 4. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Nun excuse me, Moses' servant, Moses, my servant, is now dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land that I am about to give them to the Israelites. I will give you every place where your foot is set, as I promised to Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the West. I'd like to talk about a few things that God uses to prepare his people. It's interesting in Joshua chapter 1 and verse 1, that God allowed Moses, the servant of the Lord, to die. And Israel camped on the east side of the Jordan, and it was there that they mourned for Moses for 30 days. And it was a very sad time. It was a very uh, uncertain time for Israel. One of the, the things that's being studied in, in the business world, and uh, in particular in Christian ministry, is the issue of transition. How do we move from one generation to the other, and how do you effectively pass on, in particular, a ministry uh, after the founder uh, leaves? And sometimes the way that God has dealt with transition is that he allows something to die before he begins something new. And that is one of the ways in which God moves his people forward. And Moses was a particularly uh, significant person in the history of Israel. And yet one of the things that we learn from Joshua chapter 1 immediately is this. No man is indispensable to God, but God is indispensable to man. Das Wort indispensable heißt unersetzlich. Did that help? <laughs> 
Sometimes the only way that God is going to move forward is by allowing something or someone to die. And it takes a lot of courage to face that method, but that's sometimes the way that God moves us forward, and we need to allow him uh, to choose the point where someone or something dies. And always remember that although a servant of God may die, God does not die. His servants die, but he does not. Jesus is alive and well, even in the face of one of his servants moving on. And one of the things that we need to realize is that the person is never the source of blessing. Jesus is. And we can't confuse the means that God uses to bless us with the origin. God is always the origin of blessing in his son. And he may use men and women or boy or girl as his means through which Christ is going to bless us. It was in 1986 that the director of Bodensiev took me to a meeting of the leaders of the European torchbearer centers. I was 25 years old and there was a, a, a certain sense in which I had no business being there, but the leader wanted me to go because he wanted me to watch and learn. So he said, keep your mouth shut and open your ears. And the year before that, and I'll speak about this experience later on this week, I had met M Major Thomas uh, after hearing him in Bible school uh, in a very significant way in, in a turning point in my life the year before. So when he was at this meeting, uh, I ran up to him one of the first days and gave him a hug and I said, Major Thomas, it's great to see you. I, I just, I hope we have some time together. He looked at me and said, I hope not, and walked away. And I was, I, I was breathless. But he recognized me, uh, something about me, and it was this. I was becoming a, a disciple of Major Thomas and, and not staying a disciple of Jesus. And he would not allow anybody to cling to his person because he knew that someday he was no longer going to be there. And if that day came and my faith was placed in Major Thomas, I would be shattered. And that day came in 2007. He went home to be with his Lord. I'm thankful for Major Thomas, but I'm more thankful that he taught me how to trust Jesus. Because I'll always have him, even when Major is gone. We can't allow... A mentor, a pastor, a teacher, a counselor to replace Jesus. There's an interesting comment in John chapter 1 and verse 37 about John the Baptist. It says they heard John speak and then they followed Jesus. And there's a sense in which John the Baptist lost his congregation to Jesus. Never let your mentor become your master. Never let your mentor replace the master. Our faith is not placed in Christians, it's, it, it's placed in Christ. Having said that, the fact of the matter is that God gives us people through whom we learn how to trust in Christ. And thank God that he does. Paul said this in the book of Timothy, or excuse me, uh, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 9, the things that you have learned and received and heard from me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. So what you have heard, learned, seen in me, do the same thing. So there is a very valid place for coming alongside other Christians and watching them, living with them, and learning from them. Always knowing that our trust is in Christ, not the Christian. And it is my deep conviction that we'll probably learn more through walking with people than just listening to a podcast or reading a book about how to live the Christian life. If I was in your stage of life, I would be like Elisha, running after Elijah. I would be seeking out older brothers and sisters who have walked with the Lord longer than we have, and you don't leave them alone. 
and just get alongside them. Scripture says in the book of Proverbs, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. We will become like the people with whom we spend the most time. We will become like the people with whom we spend the most time. This is not rocket science. You can tell uh, the kind of person a person is going to become by their choice of friends. You, you can tell what is the end product is going to be by the amount of time they're spending with certain kinds of people. They will become like the people with whom they spend time. So seek out people who are going to sharpen you. And would that God give us them at the time that we need it. Earlier on, before Moses ever departed, he was, he was actually told to encourage Joshua in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 38, and Deuteronomy chapter 3 and verse 28. Deuteronomy 1 and Deuteronomy 3, God told Moses, I want you to encourage Joshua. New leaders need more encouragement than advice. Encouragement is going to help them more than just advice. And by the way, criticism is not listed as a gift of the Spirit. In German, we have a wonderful word, rechthaberisch. You want to be right. And so we get into these discussions, and, and, and you know, that's not the way to do it. The people who have helped me most who have, are the ones who have come alongside, put their armor on me, and encouraged me. And we can't underestimate that. New leaders need more encouragement than just advice. I, do, I don't have this verse uh, up on, on the PowerPoint, but just note where I'm getting it. It's out of Exodus chapter 33, and I'm going to read verses 9 to 11. Exodus 33 and verses 9 to 11. It says this. Exodus 33 verses 9 to 11. Whenever Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. When all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would arise and worship each at the entrance of his tent. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, just as a man speaks to his friends. When Moses returned to the camp, his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Earlier in that passage, we realized that Moses built a tent. He called it the tent of meeting. And it wasn't the tabernacle because the tabernacle hadn't been built yet. So this was a separate tent. It was, it was not the tabernacle, nor was it the tent that he lived in, but it was a little ways outside of the camp. And periodically, he would walk to this tent and he would meet there and the cloud would descend on this tent and the presence of God would be there and it says that God would speak to him there as a man speaks face to face. And the one that he took with him was Joshua. And it's very significant that in verse 7, it says, when Moses returned to the camp, his servant Joshua the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. And Joshua was, was taken into the intimacy of this relationship between the living God and Moses, and he watched Moses meet with God so often, so intimately, that he began to want the God that Moses met so that he could speak with him himself. That's the goal of mentoring. That's the goal of, of discipleship. Of, of, of coming into a relationship with, with Christ out of a first-hand experience as you have watched somebody else live out of a first-hand experience of Jesus. Do you know the people who have influenced me the most in Christ are often the people who are least aware of it? 
They, they haven't tried to play the fourth person of the Trinity in my life after a church service. They have so lived with Jesus that I've gone away from them saying to myself, I want to know Jesus like that. And they didn't even know what kind of effect they were having on me. They didn't even know it. Uh, I've, I've, run a, um, I've run a marathon two times. That doesn't make me a marathon runner. It just means I was stupid enough to try it a second time. <laughs> the first time was when I was 30. It was in 1990 in Berlin. It was the first time that they had run it in both sides of the city. And the second one was when I was 40, and that one was in Vancouver. You want to run Berlin, not Vancouver, because Vancouver runs through... The, uh, is it, what's, what's the park on the island? Robson? Pardon me? Stanley Park. Stanley Park, thank you. You have to run up and down Stanley Park. And, it, and then over the bridges, you know, the bridges are curved in Vancouver, so it's not flat. Anyway, uh, you know, I go to my first marathon in, in, in Berlin, and they didn't have the technology. Today, they put a chip in your shoe, and you run across a piece of, of you know, carpet, and then it ticks off the time in your shoe and then you run over the carpet at the finish line and it gets the exact time. They didn't have that in 1990. I was lined up in these blocks from A to Z or Z, whatever country you come from. And uh, I was like in block Y because I'd never run a marathon before. So the gun went off and three minutes later I reached the starting line. And then I run this marathon and uh, I, I get through the finish line, and I cried like a baby. I was just physically and emotionally spent. I told that to my mother one time, and she said, that's how I felt when you, I brought you into this world, and don't you forget it. <laughs> I never saw the winner that day. I read his name in the paper the next day. But I know this one thing. He didn't win by accident. What he had been doing in training before he reached the starting line at Berlin, by and large, determined the outcome of that race in his case. You see, the race was not won at the finish line, it was, it was won at the starting line because he had prepared himself properly. And everything that had been happening in private secretly before that race, all of a sudden became uh, revealed in public. You see, who I am in private is going to determine who I am in my public ministry. And when God is going to use somebody, it's never by accident. They have been making choices in private that nobody else knows about but God himself. And God had been meeting with Joshua before this event takes place in Joshua chapter 1. And it teaches me that the, that the most important thing that I have to do in my own ministry is guard my own walk with the Master. Because it's the authenticity of my walk with Christ that is going to be the most profitable for somebody I, I minister to. And honestly, having now been in, in this work for 35 years, the students can smell a fake a mile away. The students are pretty discerning. They can tell if somebody's the real deal or not. And that is a very humbling thing. Because you always have to minister out of your own experience of Christ. And you can't take anybody deeper than you yourself have already gone. Your leadership is based on your relationship. And your authority rests in your authenticity. So guard your walk with Jesus above all others. Do you know when you're sitting in a plane that, you know, the, the, the flight personnel is giving a bunch of announcements and then they do the one with the oxygen mask? If you notice closely, when they make this, you know, announcement, should cabin pressure decrease during flight, a mask will fall out above your seat. Please, uh, uh, you know, take on the, map to your, uh, the, the, the mask to yourself and then help somebody beside you. And I'm thinking, is it, you know, that's not a very Christian assignment. That, that's not, you know, isn't the order, you know, help others before you help yourself? Well, if you're dead, you can't help anybody else. So that's why they say you put on the mask first. 
so that you're in a position to help somebody else. And there's a sense in which that is true in our walk with Christ. Make sure that we are living out of a first-hand experience of Jesus. And Joshua stayed in that tent and he met with the living God so that when Moses' servant died, it wasn't a crisis. He knew where to go. By the way, have we erected a tent of meeting in our lives with Jesus? Have we established a holy habit to meet with him? That's not legalism. That's the basis of endurance. So God's preparation includes God's people. Secondly, it includes God's timing. When God created time, he created enough time to do his will in your life. When God created time, he created enough time to do his will in your life. God's got enough time. It's just that, as I said earlier this morning, my perception of how much time God is taking, <laughs> sometimes I don't like that because I think he takes too much time. God has time. The nature of lust is that I have to have it now. The nature of trust is I'm going to let Jesus take his time if that's what he chooses to do. If you look at the um, life of Joshua, from birth to age 45, he lived in Egypt. From age 45 to age 85, he wandered with the people of God in the desert from 45 to 85, and then from age 85 to age 110, he was involved in full-time Christian service. Zero to 45 in Egypt, age 45 to 85, and this is the thing that really impresses me about Joshua, he lived in the midst of a disobedient congregation and lived with the consequences of their disobedience when he himself knew and had testified the goodness of Canaan. And yet he had to live with the consequences of their disobedience. The thing that interests me about Joshua is that he didn't form another deeper life movement. He didn't go somewhere else and plant a church. He walked with God in that desert, although he didn't deserve it. And then God, when he, the time was right, when he was 85 years old, places him in this position of leadership at a very significant moment in the history of Israel. Friends, if things get difficult in your ministry, in your church, in your camp, or your student group, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's time for you to leave. If your church is unsatisfactory back home, it doesn't always mean that it's time for a change. It could be that God has placed you there to be a channel of influence in Christ. And so although, although the circumstances might not be satisfactory in your opinion, it's not necessarily time to move on. And God's leading in my life doesn't just lead me from, it leads me to. And we need much wisdom as to the timing of God. And, and while we're in maybe a dissatisfactory, an unsatisfactory situation, learn your lessons. It is a wise young person who hangs around and learns not only from the things that are done in a right way, they, they learn from the things that are done in a wrong way so that they don't repeat the same mistake. Learn from other people's mistakes so that you don't have to make them yourself. And there was something about Moses' death. He died when he was 120, and, and yet it says he was still full of life. But God took him early. 
Joshua lived under tremendously difficult uh, uh, conditions. The people wanted to stone him to death, it says in Numbers chapter, chapter 14. The majority wanted to kill him. So if things in your situation, in your spiritual home are tough, that is the time when we learn how to draw from Jesus himself. Because if you ever get into a position of responsibility in the future, leadership can be very lonely by the nature of the task. Because you're going to have to make decisions that others are not going to agree with. You're going to have to trust Jesus in a way that other people are not willing to. Only one, Peter, got out of the boat on the lake and left the other 11 behind. And sometimes that's going to be the nature of, of, of God's preparation in our lives. Truth lies in the minority, and he may give you a hard life in order to give you a soft heart. One of the things I see happening today is that we are settling for a virtual spirituality we, we at sometimes, as it says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, we are always learning but never coming to a knowledge of the truth because we have so much available to us in the Western world. And so we're, we're content with a second-hand experience of Jesus. And so people indicate that by, by holding people and events and, and, and ministries on a pedestal and... and there's going to become a time when the virtual life needs to become a real life. And that can only, only happen sometimes through hardship and through God taking his time. A third thing that I notice uh, about uh, Joshua is that in, in Numbers 27 and in Deuteronomy 34, it says that he was filled with the Spirit of God. In Numbers 27 in Deuteronomy 34, it says that he was filled with the Spirit of God. And, and sometimes uh, God is going to need to take his time before we are filled with the presence of Christ, before he becomes uh, effectually powerful through our lives. And the reason why that is so important is because the service of God is always matched with the Spirit of God, and we can only reach divine goals with divine, divine means. But God always endows us with the Spirit to reach spiritual goals. There is nobody who is more tired than the one who is trying to do the work of God in the strength of man. There's nobody who's more tired than that. It's like you're trying to make the impossible possible. It, it, it doesn't work. And so God endowed this man and then with his spirit and he allowed him to learn how to walk in the power uh, of his spirit. God's promise. Let's turn to Joshua chapter 1 and I'll read verses uh, Five through nine. God's promise. Joshua said, or God said to Joshua in Joshua chapter one, verse five, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead this people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the left or to the right, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything that is written in it. Then you will be prosperous, and then you'll be successful." Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Joshua and the task before him was, was incredible. 
One commentator said that to feed the nation of Israel every day with, with manna, it would have taken 50, uh, 50 train cars full of manna to feed the population for one day. Uh, the amount of water that they would have needed would have been 12 million gallons per day. The area which the camp of Israel would have taken up in the, in the wilderness would have been 100 square miles. This was a huge group of people. And it's not like they were moving uh, every day. Actually, their movements were seldom. But that just gives you the, the, the amount of resources that were needed to feed these people. And God put this man in charge of a task which he was not able to do. Put him in charge of a task which he was not able to do. And that's why Joshua needed so much encouragement and he needed the promise of God at this point. And we need to know that our sufficiency must be drawn from our master and not his service. And if anybody had reason to fear, it was, it was Joshua. And that's why three times here it says, do not fear, do not fear, do not fear. Be strong and courageous. I have commanded you to be strong and courageous. Because when you get into, you know, a position of ministry, usually you're going to be faced with things that you cannot do on your own. And God places us in those situations so that he might prove, I'm going to do this and not you. This is dependent upon my sufficiency, not your ability. Again, fear is the default setting of the human heart, and his work is to reset it with faith. I think it's over 350 times in the Bible that God tells his people, don't fear, don't fear, don't fear. If God has to repeat himself so often, that tells me that I'm given to fear. It's interesting. Um, you know, the leader you should follow is the one who is reluctant to lead that's the leader you should follow. The one who is reluctant to lead. Because they will, they, they, they will know their, their own weakness. Uh, they will know that they're given to fear. They will know that they're going to face opposition in ministry. They, they will know that they will often walk in, in a minority. They will know that they will have to make decisions that are unpopular. They will know that this position is going to include suffering. They will know that they will be tremendously understood. Follow the leader that is reluctant to lead. God said to him in Joshua 1.8, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will be, have success. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you will meditate on it. To meditate on God's word and to store it in our hearts is the challenge for us. Many times we can speak about God's word, but, but the, the, the question is, is God's word shaping my heart? A man of God is a man of God's word, and I've said this often to our students, feed your faith and you'll starve your doubts. You see, God's word says in Romans 10, 17, so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Romans 10 and verse 17. You guys are doing something so good for yourselves in being here for this length of Bible school. And it's no secret that our students leave Bible school often uh, feeling more confident about their relationship with Christ not just because they have stuffed their brains with Bible facts, but they have allowed their thinking to be penetrated with truth 
And that truth then sinks into their hearts and gives them assurance, I can trust Jesus. It's so important to know that. What I think determines what I believe. And, and my thinking patterns cannot just be given over to chance. They need to be formed by truth. And the more this happens, the more my faith is going to be fed. We had a gal in our small group at Bowdoin's a number of years ago. She was one of the older students at school, probably in her late 20s. And uh, she quit her job having saved enough money to come to Bible school. And in our small group, as was the case with, with most small groups, everybody gave their testimony at some time, and she did too. And when she gave her testimony, she surprised our small group by saying that many years, uh, for many years, she had suffered from depression. And you never would have thought that about her because of the way that she carried herself with a humble confidence and a friendliness and a servant's heart. And she said that what happened was, uh, in her church, somebody told her about an, another older woman of God that she could seek out for counseling. And she sought out this other woman, and she went to her house for counseling. And this older woman, uh, greeted her and then shortly after the introductions this woman said now here's a promise of god to his people and if you're god's child this means you too go home and memorize this one promise of god and she said i was a little bit surprised because i thought we were going to go through this deep counseling session but i went home and memorized that promise of god to his to his people she said she came back the second week and she thought now the counseling is going to begin and this woman said okay tell me the verse she rattled off this verse by heart and said this woman said that's good here's a second promise of god to his people go home memorize this verse this week and then come back next week and i'll give you a few more she was confused, but she went home and did that. And then the number of verses began to increase every week. And she said by the time she had left this so-called counseling relationship, she had memorized over 150 promises of God in his word. But the significant thing was she walked out of this dark valley. I'm old enough to know that depression can have other complicated uh, um, reasons. But what this young woman understood was when truth determines what I think about myself, knowing what God thinks about me and what he has promised me, suddenly truth will sink down into the heart and give the heart assurance. He loves me. He lives in me. He will never leave me. He will never forsake me. He has promised to complete what he started. So feed your faith and you'll starve your doubts. It's, again, it's not rocket science. It's very simple. Faith is fed by truth. This is why I tell our students, get off of Facebook and get your face back in the book. And the goal is that you may be careful to do, not just preach, everything that is written in it. Joshua's success lie in his obedience, not in his, his ability. His success lie in his obedience, not necessarily his, ob his ability. Most of us are educated way beyond our obedience. I love to study God's word. I love God's word. But the truth about Peter Reed is, if Peter Reed would obey everything that he knows, he would be a spiritual giant. But I don't. And so it's my obedience to the word of God that is the significant thing. I need to hide it in my heart. Scripture says in Colossians chapter 3, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you.
so that I might obey it. I don't know if you've ever thought about it in this way, but your attending Bible school is increasing your capacity to sin. It says in James chapter 4 in verse 17, the one who knows the right thing to do and doesn't do it, to him it is sin. <laughs> We're learning a lot of the right things to do. But the dangerous thing is, the more I know, the more God holds me responsible to obey. If I'm responsible to do what God says, he's always responsible to do what he says. And I wrote here as well, our obedience to his word may cause inconvenience to others. Do it anyway. If that means changing your mind, change your mind. If that means not going on a trip, don't go on the trip. If, if that means you can't be involved in the things that others are involved in, don't be involved with him. Make sure that you're obeying God's word. Power comes through obedience to God's word, not just a knowledge of God's word. And the thing that uh, Joshua learned, he actually said, I have not put this on the PowerPoint, but it's in Joshua chapter 23 and verse 14. At the very end of his life, this man who, who had meditated and stored God's word in his heart so that he might do it. At the end of his life, he said this. In Joshua 23 and verse 14, Now behold, today I am going the way of all the earth. And you know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one word of all the good words which the Lord your God spoke concerning you has failed. All have been fulfilled for you not one of them has failed. What a tremendous thing to be able to say at the end of his life. I have proven in my own experience God does what he says. Why? Because I've done what he told me to do. One of the reasons why we experience insecurity in our walk with the Lord is very simply this. It's because of one issue of disobedience. And that issue of disobedience is going to quench the spirit. If the spirit is quenched, he never leaves me. He's present, but he's not powerful. And sometimes the answer to our insecurity is repentance and coming to a point of new, new obedience. And obedience breeds confidence. There's only one thing to fear in the Christian life, and that's our own disobedience. But when we are be obedient to God's word, God will always carry the consequences of our own obedience to him. And you can rest in him. There are so many things that come up in, in, in Christian ministry that, that are so hard, but if you know you've lived with a clean conscience before him, and you know you've been obedient to his word as best you can, and his spirit is not convicting you on any point, come what may, you'll have a rest and a confidence in Jesus. This man became a man of God's word, and he began to realize that God's commands are also God's promises. Father, I want to thank you that you've given us your word. I want to thank you that the Bible is a book of which proves that you always do what you say. And Lord, I'd simply pray that you would have mercy on us and bring those things to light that we need to obey in your presence. I thank you that you're going to honor your word and that the word of God, which is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, is going to penetrate at a level which no human being can. I thank you for that. Lord, we pray that you would make us usable for your own name's sake. Amen. Thanks, you guys.